Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You are welcome to Lagos Mom once more. I'm happy to be here. And I'll be making a presentation today on IP, secured IP telephony. Oh, my name is Dapo Homolukun. I'm Microtech Certified Trainer, Microtech Certified Consultant. Uh, I have a background in electronics with applied physics, and I'm a member of the IEEE. I've been working with Microtech for 13 years, and I've been certified since 2007. This presentation is actually a case study of a deployment we actually did. So it's not a theoretical presentation, it's a presentation about something that we actually did and is working here in Nigeria. Uh, it discussed a technique for the implementation of secured wide area VOIP teleconferencing using Microtech routers and Linksys video phones. This the original deployment was done for a, the Nigerian government, a security organization. Uh, after that deployment, we've done additional deployment. People have come to look at it and they've, they are interested. And we've done additional de deployment for many other organizations, including churches. Some big name churches in Nigeria have implemented this solution for the organization. Why do we need this? We know the public switch network. The public switch network is your regular telephone network. You pick up your phone, you make a call. Hmm? We know that network is highly susceptible to wire tapping, sniffing, bugging by security organizations. You're only deceiving yourself if you pick up your, call, your line and you make a call and you think you are secured. That line that communication is act might actually be recorded by one or two organizations, and it can be used to embarrass you later. Mm. Now, even the packet network, the packet network, which is the internet, has not fared better than the switch network. Today, a lot of espionage and sniffing is going on on the packet network. You do oh, Skype call, all these your calls using packet network. They have been sniffed, they have been recorded. We have been see, seen a lot of great embarrassing exposures. Like the former president of uh, France, the, television, the, telephone, the embarrassing telephone leak. We've seen, even here in Nigeria, high level telephone leaks like Fayoche, Fayoche versus Wiki. Have, have you not seen that? Did you not? We, we, we've had telephone leaks with security organizations. Once every security organization A is monitoring security organization B, and B is doing the same to C, everybody is watching the other. Everybody is sniffing. We are in a very dangerous times where nothing is safe. Look at the WikiLeaks. Look at the American government election. Look at the election in America. Look at all sorts of things. So the onus of protecting yourself lies on you. The government is not interested in protecting you. The ISPs will dance to the tune of their regulator. It's just one letter or one communication to the ISP. We, this, we want this, they get it. So a lot of these things are being lost. Intellectual property theft. If you're an organization that is developing a cutting edge technology and you have branches scattered all around the world or even in the, in the state and you have to do inter-branch communication, then you cannot rely on the public network to do that. Somebody might just sniff your network and steal your intellectual property. Before you know, you are down. So this technique will not only protect your, sec your secrets and your trademarks, it will also, it's also very cheap. It's cheaper than using the public switch network for your interbranch communication. Because what we do here is most offices you already have internet. So we just ride over the internet, we secure the communication, and then pass your voice packet. 
in, instead of using switchnet, we use oh, packets and route it over the internet in a secured fashion. Right now, I know a lot of people are doing this. What they do is they buy IP phones, install IP phones in the branches, and they make their call. There is no protection in that too. You are exposed to attacks and sniffing. So, everybody is now apprehensive of their telephone conversation. So we are approached by this organization, which for security reasons I cannot mention names, uh, is a top level government organization. They have offices in the 36 states of Nigeria and a branch uh, headquarters in Abuja. And they want their interbranch communication secured. They want to be able to hold video conference instead of the boss in Abuja summoning the regional directors to Abuja for a meeting every now and then. They hold meeting at short notices. And it involved a lot of logistics to summon people to Abuja for the meeting. So we developed this whereby you, you can sit in your office and then do video conferencing. Hold your meeting on video conferencing in a secured manner and you are confident that nobody is, it, it, they might sniff, but they will not get nothing. It's not that you, can, you cannot stop people from sniffing. You cannot stop people from tapping on the public network. But the important thing is your packets are encapsulated and encrypted. So the sniff they see is like, I, I always say the example of an aeroplane. You see an aeroplane passing through. Mm? You can see the aeroplane, but you cannot see what is inside the aeroplane. You, you cannot name who is inside the aeroplane. So that is the type of thing we do here. So the packet is like is encapsulated and encrypted. So in this particular case, we deployed MicroTIC CCR1009 in the 36 regional offices scattered around Nigeria. And at the headquarters in Abuja, we deployed the CCR uh, 1036 for, because it's obviously a more capable router. And all the 36 locations will be connecting to the Abuja uh, 1036 to establish a secure tunnel. Now we want this to be very, very, very robust and uh, always up. So we deployed three uh, ISPs. We are not relying on one ISP because it's going to be a major communication between all the offices. So we provided some redundancy into the link. Uh, we built in phase safe so that at every location you have multiple ISPs and they are set in a phase safe manner with load sharing. The load is shared among all the ISPs and if any ISP goes down, the router quickly sends the ISPs down and all packets are shifted to the other links, the other links that are up. Transparently, you don't have to do nothing. You won't even know the ISP is down. The, the router quickly take care of that. And we put in good adaptive firewall because the network is divided into two segments. There is a segment for the conventional data packets. That's your browsing and stuff like that. Then another segment of it for the VOIP. So there is firewall to protect against aggression from outside. The firewall is quite intelligent and adaptive. I will discuss a little bit about that later. Uh, we have load balancing and we have quality of service. The quality of service was made very simple because the network has been segmented at the initial. So it was more like uh, a segment of the network prioritized over the other segment. The VOIP segment was prioritized. Every packet that go on the VOIP segment was prioritized over the data, pack, the data segment. Uh, this makes the, the technique very simple and easy to implement as against a firewall or QoS that require, uh, if we have lumped all the segment in one segment, it will have, we will need to do a very complicated QoS, which will consume resources and even slow down the packet. So the idea if you're implementing this is to segment the two network, the data network and your VoIP network. 
So, and we use SSTP. SSTP to create secure tunnels between the HQ and the, all the branch locations. Now the VOIP equipment deployed were on private IP addresses. We have public IP addresses available, but it was a deliberate policy to put the VOIP equipment on private IP addresses for security purposes. We don't want under any circumstance for the VOIP packets to go in an unsecured net network. If we use public IP on the VOIP equipment, then somebody might be able to dial in out from outside using the, pack, the data network as against using the tunnel. So this is a technique to ensure that if the tunnel is not up, anytime the tunnels go down, then you cannot use the VOIP equipment. That will make you aware whatever you do in that circumstance is not secured. So it will not, you know, when you have false sense of security, it's even worse than when you don't have security. So typically that's Nigeria. At Abuja, we have the server, the server here, and all these other states dial into Abuja via SSTP. And the tunnel comes up, the VIP packets are now routed across the tunnel. So if Bono wants to talk to Lagos, the, the packet goes from Bono to Abuja, then from Abuja to Lagos. Now let's look at the setup. The wide area network deployed over three autonomous ISPs. We sometimes you, you buy service from an ISP, then you buy a second service thinking you have autonomy. You don't because the back end of both ISPs might be the same. Here in Lagos, you buy from Swift or from Smile. You, you are under the impression you have two autonomous sources. The back end might be just SAT 3 or main 1. So if SAT 3 goes down, Everything goes down. So you don't have no autonomy. <laughs> so when, when you're doing this, you have to make a, take extra effort to ensure you find out what the back end of your ISP is. You don't want to buy service from two ISPs with the same back end. So in our case, we made sure we had Glow 1, Main 1, and SAT 3. If your ISP it, it, it ask them, some of them will give you false information. When they deploy the service, just do trace out. Trace out will eventually tell you how the packet is routed across the internet, so you can find out. So for the case, we, we put the three ISPs in the first three ports, the three ISPs in the first three ports, and we use the new feature of the MicroTik Router OS, which is the interface list. This, these interfaces were now put in the same list. This is to make our firewall configuration simply later. Because for every ISP, we need to put firewall settings. So instead of doing it for per ISP, using the interface list feature allow you to do it only once and it's applied to the three ISPs. So after we've ensured the autonomy of the network, we now proceeded to do load sharing. Load sharing as against load balancing. They, they sound the same thing, but they're not exactly the same thing. Load balancing, you can easily accomplish that with ECMP. But load sharing in, the, in a situation where you have links that don't have the same capabilities. Maybe we, your main link has a 10 MBPF throughput. Then you buy it backup links with five Mbps or two Mbps. These are links with, that don't have the same capabilities. So in this case, you need a policy that will let the router know the capability of the links, as against just lumping them together. This can be achieved by using the per connection classifier. And we, 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 when I discuss PCC, I will show you how we achieved that. So then we put phase safe. 
face save in the routing table where we prioritize after balancing the load, the load is shared on the ISPs according to their capabilities. And then we have the default routes. All the three ISPs are put in a default route with distance separating them. We use the distance parameter to prioritize one ISP over the other for face save consideration. The default route essentially don't get used. It's the policy routing that gets used. It's when an ISP is down. Then the policy routing for that ISP goes down. Then the default route gets used in that case, just for that packet going to that ISP. All the other packets still go to the respective ISPs using policy routes. On the LAN segment, uh, we have the data network. This, this area, that's your data network. And we have the PoIP network in different IP space. So for the PCC, since we have an ISP with bigger link, what we did is the peering. The first packet out of the LAN network gets sent to ISP1. The second packet gets sent to ISP2. The third packet gets sent to ISP3. But this is of doing that because they are not the, of equal capabilities. We send the first packet through ISP1, second packet through ISP2, third packet through ISP1, fourth packet through ISP2. You get it? Because it's like a ratio of two to one. The capabilities of the links is like a ratio of two to one. So for every two packets I send to the first ISP with the higher capability link, I send one packet to the lower capability link. That's exactly what I was trying to say. From the LAN, the packets come in the Mango, in Mango table, the Mango table we use PCC to classify based on source IP and destination IP. So the packets are now sorted and each of the packets goes to the different ISPs. When it goes out on the interface, when it gets to the interface, it's now knotted before it goes to the internet. And when we did this, we now che check to see how, how good is balancing. This is just to print. In this case, I'm printing the or uh, connection mark, the counting how many, co how many uh, connections have a particular mark. The, the, we have the one, 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 two, and one, three marks in the PCC, which we have used to segment the packets. In the first one, you can see the count. The one, one, there are 16,507 packets going to one, one. There are 637 packets going to one, two. There are 707 packets going to one, three. This is fairly well balanced, considering that uh, it's a two one one balancing we have done. So this is sixteen thousand at against for fourteen thousand something. You know, it cannot be a perfect balance because some some connections time out quicker than the others. Even at the outgoing stage, when the router is balancing, the router try to achieve a perfect balance. But not all connections are held for the same duration of time. So some packets will time out faster than the other. So that is why there's a slight imbalance. But this is reasonably balanced. So the router has really done his work here. So the after marking the packets with the connection mark in PCC, we equally mark with the routing mark. And this routing mark will now be used on the routing table to force the packet according to our policy. One other thing I want to draw your attention to is when you are doing routing or oh, route, oh, oh, recursive routing, okay, let me discuss it. We, we again use the recursive routing in this network for a very simple reason. You know, the gateway check in your, on your routing table when you have gateway check, ping or hop, it only check the next op. The next op is your ISP. 
your ISP, the link between you and your ISP, that is what is being checked by the gateway check in the router. The link between you and your ISP might be down, might be up, but the link between the ISP and the internet might be down. In this case, if you just use gateway check ping, then this will not work well because the router will not know when the ISP is down. As long as it has a, the link between the router and the ISP is up, the, routing the routes in the routing table remains up. There is a better way of doing this instead of just doing gateway check ping. It's called recursive routing. Recursive routing, you, you, you actually will be checking against a known IP on the internet as against checking or, or to your ISP. A typical case you can use, you can use the Google DNS or any popular DNS or any good, reliable IP on the internet. In this case, you, you, you need three routes to accomplish this in your routing table. You will need three routes. You create the first route to that destination. Let me, let me. You create the first route. So in this case, we are using the 4222, 4.2.2.4, the Google DNS server. So you create route one to that destination, which is the public IP you want to use for your recursive routing. One very important thing in item one is you must make sure the scope is within the target scope. The target scope is within the scope. This will ensure that this route is always up. This route is always up, even when the link is down. But in previous, in some editions of router OS, we had the issue where if you do this under certain conditions, the link still goes down. So in this case, to be safe, we created a second route on the routing table, which is the black hole route. You want to create a, a fallback for the same destination. You have created the first route for that destination. Then you create a second route. You see, the destination is the same thing. Then you make it a type black hole and give it a longer distance so that if the first route, for any reason, if the first route goes down, eh, this comes up and still ensure your packets don't go through the wrong way. What I'm trying to say is, if you create this without this second one, under certain condition, when that link, when your link goes down, the link that is using this interface goes down, you know the routing table will quickly switch packets to the available link. You have more, you have so many links on the internet. So this, the router you, you will be deceived to see that this IP is now pingable. And then it will flip that route, it will flip it up again. So you have a situation where you have flip, off, on, off, on. Creating a black hole route solves that problem. Because the moment this goes down, the black hole comes up and the router will think, this is, knows that that packet for this destination is, it should, be, should, should be trapped, should be trapped inside the router. So it, the flipping cannot happen. So once you have those two policies set, then you create your default route, number three there. That's your default route. But instead of the default route pointing to your next up, the default route in this case is now pointing to the external IP. So if you set up your route, the routing table this way, if your I, the link between you and your ISP, your router and your ISP is up, and the link between the ISP and the internet is down, your router will actually be clever enough to know your ISP is down. And it will take down all routes pointing to your ISP, it takes them down. So the important thing here is you set this scope to be within the target scope. Then, for the ping, for the check, in this, on this two, there is no ping. On the default route now, on the default route, the ping is there. So, th and one ping suffices for all routes, every route that points to that gateway, the 222, two, two, whatever that gateway is. You don't have to repeat the ping for them. Once you have ping once in one route, then it will, it, once it will take care of all destinations that point there. 
So don't repeat it continuously. So we chose SSI, SSTP for obvious reason for the, for the tunnel. There are a lot of tunnels. SSTP is not the fastest tunnel. It's not, SSTP is slow. There are faster tunnels. But SSTP has a big advantage over all the tunnels. And that is SSTP cannot be blocked. SSTP, your ISP cannot block SSTP. If it blocks ISSTP, the inter half of the internet or three quarter of the internet goes down. And across the world, the government is becoming more interested in what goes on in the internet. And there is censorship. There is censorship. In some countries, the government have issued instructions for ISPs to block tunnels. They don't even allow you to use tunnels in those countries. So like HTTP, PPTP, stuff like that can be easily blocked by ISP based on government policy. Even in Nigeria here, though the government has not gotten to the level where they are blocking tunnels, what I can tell you today, in Nigeria, SEC is already doing censorship. NCC has blocked a lot of sites. People might not know. It's just one, one letter copied to all the ISPs. And I'm quite aware a lot of sites as of even last week, another letter came out and some sites were blocked. So we, one of the reasons why we choose SSTP is no government is going to block you. So if you set up today this, using SSTP, no government is going to block you. They cannot do that. But by default, the default firewall configuration in most routers will not allow connection from outside into the router. It will not. So if you are using that's why the fact that SSTP cannot be blocked. You still have to put policy in your router if you are using firewall to accept SSTP packet from outside. If you don't do that, your SSTP tunnels will not come up. So on the server end, on the server end of the tunnel, you need to actively put oh, TCP protocol TCP port 443 to accept from the, from the IPs that will be dialing in. If, I, if you don't know the IPs dialing in, just accept that so that your tunnels can come up. So in the firewall, the tunnels were created and we allowed SSTP to go to the, we only allowed to, to, to go to the IP phone and every other packet goes to the LAN segment, to the data network. Another thing you need to take care of is port forwarding. We have put the IP phones on private IPs, but if you forward ports to those private IPs, then you still run the risk of unencrypted communication. So you must ensure there are no port forwarding in your router, port forwarded for, those, for that IP range in your router so that you don't run that risk, and make sure there is no NAT. When you're doing your NAT, in this case, make sure the NAT is specified for a range. We, most of us always specify the NAT by interface, outgoing interface, especially source NAT. You say source NAT outgoing. In this case, you need to specify the source NAT for the range you want source NAT to happen for, which is the data packet range. Another good reason we picked the SSL, uh, the SSTP, is the router OS implementation allow you to run on SSTP without SSL certificate. You know, Microsoft and Cisco will not allow you to run SSTP without SSL certificate. And you, to, you need to buy SSL certificates. So in this case, Microsoft router OS actually allowed you to do that. So, and secondly, another reason is the SSTP tunnel require public IP only on one end of the tunnel, ideally on the server end. This will allow you to buy cheap internet service at the client end. So you are not tied to buying the expensive business class internet at the other end. You can buy very cheap internet service that comes with private IP address on the, on the client end and only make sure you buy quality internet on the server end. 
so that just, uh, you save cost. So this is a typical scenario. We have the HQ, we have the HQ here, and tunnels go through the internet, the tunnel goes through the wider internet, goes through the internet to HQ, that's the SSTP tunnels. Why the data packet goes straight? The data packet goes straight to the internet and gets reply. So it's only for the VOIP packets and the IP telephony that goes through the tunnel to the HQ. And packet gets rerouted at the HQ. If Kanu comes in, Kanu is calling Lagos, comes in, the, pack, the uh, router here routes the packet to Lagos. Yeah, you can see some of the tunnels that were established while I was, I was making this present slide. A few of the SSTP tunnels have been established. You can see packets going on it. For the quality of service, we put the IP phone on dedicated subnet. We created committed information rate, make sure we uh, assign committed information rate, that's dedicated band, what we call dedicated bandwidth, to the, that subnet. The entire subnet, the bandwidth was assigned to the entire subnet, and we use the uh, PAC, PC, PA, PCQ, we use PCQ uh, as policy, to assign, to make sure every, to every com uh, IP phone gets quality bandwidth. Uh, the packet, the, the interface is prioritized. It's prioritized over every other thing. We gave the interface, the VIP interface, priority one, and every other thing, priority eight. So, to ensure that the quality of service works. It is very important when you are doing quality of service if you want it to work, it is mandatory you do a parent queue. I've seen quality of service, most people do quality of service, and they just put child queue, children child queue, too many child queue, and the quality of service is not working reliably. For your quality of service to work reliably, you need to create a parent queue. Like in this case, we created a parent queue. In the parent queue, we only assign the total bandwidth available to the, to the uh, parent queue. We now create child queue. In, in the parent queue, where we can now give separate bandwidth. In the, in the example here, we have assigned the total bandwidth available at these places, 30 meg, 30 MB. We assigned 20 MB. We assigned 20 MB to the VIP packets and allow the data packets to take whatever it can get because our main aim here is for the VIP. So this way, your quality of service will work very well. You can see the priority. You can see the priorities there. It's very important to use priority to distinguish. Now the interface, the VIP interface is now connected to a switch. From the switch, we connected the video phones and the IPB PBS. The IPB PBS and every, uh, every other phone is connected to the IPB PBS. Static IP address is now assigned in a private range. Static is now assigned in a private range to the IP phones. And with this, you can just pick up a phone and make calls. It works transparently. I would like to discuss some of the quality of uh, the configuration of this. This is supposed to be both a technical and a non-technical class. So I've discussed the non-technical part of it. Now let's take a small look at the technical part of it. Uh, am I, do, do I still have time? Okay. So, on the, uh, I would, pardon? 
One more, yeah, this, this slide is available, will be available on the Microtech website. Oh, best practice, first thing you do is secure your router. Mm -hmm. It is almost criminal at your level to, to leave your router without a password. I've seen that. People do it. No, it's no joke. People do that. They take the router out of the box. It's so much in a hurry. Plug it in, and it's configuring IP address, NAT, and stuff like that, forgetting about password. So best practice dictates you pick a router. The first thing you do is secure the router with a password. <laughs> so <laughs> after securing the router, we created bridges. Now, another good practice is to always use bridges. You can use the interface straight. But in a situation where you have you are you are using a Tawan for IS for your or for a, for a particular purpose, and something happens, a one is a one is got bad like lightning. We have a lot of lightning in Abuja where I come from. If you have cables going to the mast, there is no amount of protection. If you get a direct hit, the, it goes down. Sometimes you don't have money to buy a new router. You just want to quickly switch the ports. If if you don't have a bridge, if Eta1 is not in a bridge, you use Eta1 to connect to your ISP. And then you switch, Eta5 is still available in your router. You switch to Eta5. Hmm? How many places will you have to do the switch in your router? In almost 10, 20 places, you have to change configuration. Every configuration that says Eta1, you have to go back there and change to Eta5. That is a nightmare. So I make it best practice to use bridges. I create land bridge, one bridge. Then I now make the ports, uh, the, the interface, ports of the bridge. So if anything happens to that interface and I'm switching, I switch in one place, just add the new port to the bridge. That's all, and everything starts working again. So always make a good practice. So in this case, the land bridge, I'm using policy reply only for the app, reply only. This is to counter IP conflict problem. You go to some network, you see IP conflict, left, right, center, people just bring in all sorts of equipment, put it in their network, get an IP or assign an IP by himself. Maybe he knows the boss has a policy that allows him to do 10 Mbps. The messenger in the office is very smart. He takes his router, put it in the network, change the IP to the IP of the boss because the boss is not in. And now he starts streaming video at the expense of the organization. So, and then when the boss comes back, the boss put on his system and the IP conflict, and you have also a problem. So if you want to solve IP pro conflict problems, you, on the interface that you are going to use to serve your clients, use the IP policy, the app policy to reply only. Then use DHCP. Use DHCP to populate the app table. So that if somebody changes app address, or if you don't get uh, DHCP from DHCP IP from the router, you are not on the network. It makes your network very secure, and you solve the problem of IP conflict. That's why we are doing that. And we created a three-one interface. And I need, we need to go ahead to create the interface list. All these one ports are now added into interface list one so that I can do policy, my firewall policy, in one place, as against three places. So, IP addresses were assigned. In, this is just demonstration. The actual IP addresses were assigned for the one interface were public IP addresses. But this is just, I cannot give you that here. <laughs> <laughs> so next you have to do is set up your DNS servers. Set up your DNS. In this case, I'm using OpenDNS. OpenDNS is a very reliable server. It will allow you to do some filtration, and it's quite very, very available and always up. 
I prefer it for my DNS services against the Google DNS. As a matter of policy, I don't use IP DNS servers. And at our level, we should not be relying on IP DNS servers because uh, anything can go wrong there. Use publicly available good quality servers for your DNS resolution. With fiber, the, those days when we used to use VSAT, the run trip sometimes is 2,000 milliseconds, 3,000 milliseconds. So the, that's a long time, and we it, 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 it's better for you to use your ISP DNS, because ISP is just next up, maybe a few hundred milliseconds. But today with fiber connection, run trip to the US is 150 milliseconds. So, it's, or less, 150 milliseconds or less, the round trip. So you can rely more on public servers, public DNS servers as against your ISP servers. Of course, we set up the DHCP server on the LAN interface. And because we are using pol app, the app policy is read-only. In your DHCP configuration, you must use DHCP to hard app policies. If you don't do that, then you have to do the static, uh, you have to add the app statically. I don't know how long, how many years you are going to use for that. So it's better to allow the DHCP to populate the hub table as along. Of course, good practice, give your router an ID. If you have 1,000 routers and every ID is micro tick, when you launch your Winbox, I, I, I don't know how you are going to survive. <laughs> <laughs> the router does not come with a, with a battery. There is no battery to preserve the clock in the router. So at every reboot or every power outage, the, you lose your time on the router. So it's always good practice to set up NTP client. NTP client for your router to always get IP address. So in this case, we've done that, set up NTP client, and even set up NTP server. The NTP client allow our router to get the uh, time protocol from the internet, while at the same time, the router distributes in my network. So all the other routers in the network point to the edge router for their, for their time services. Why the edge router get the service from the internet? For the PCC, the PCC is what we use for the load sharing. So I've given the full codes in this slide, the full codes for the PCC, how we balance the load across all the three ISPs. So you have the The firewall address list, I created an address list for my private IP range and the oh, pure IP range. It's easier this way so that when I do firewall policy, I can always point to the list. Now the, the routing table set up. You can, you can see the policy routing, the first three routes here. Those are policy routing for the various ISPs, one, 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 two, one, three. And the next three routes, you can see those are the face save routes. Those are the face save routes. For any reason, if any of those routes come the, go down, the next route get used. The first one is a matter of priority. My, the first one has a distance 20. The second distance starts at distance 40. That is how we prioritize one ISP over the other. And of course, the remaining part of the route is for the recursive routing. The recursive routing I discussed with you earlier on. So, to, so that the packets can look, the router can look beyond the ISP to, to, to resolve whether the link is up or down. And in this particular case, there's a new, this service, the IP cloud service, the dynamic DNS service of the router OS. We, we actually used, in this case, we enabled it for obvious reason. At the HQ, where the uh, SSTP clients are all dialing to, if I put a static, uh, the IP of that server, there are three IPs in that server, and I don't want to bring up three tunnels. So it's easier for me to use the DNS name in SSTP. Connect to, you know, in your SSTP client, the connect to column, you, you can actually use DNS name as against using IP address. So that is why we have to use the IP cloud here to get the DNS name. So
on the server end, enable the SSTP server. One of the simplest things you can do with Microtech Router OS is to enable PPP server, any of the PPP. It's just one click. Can I? So you just click on the SSTP server, you have enabled the server. Of course, you need to set up your profile. And always, for this case, because we are paranoid about security, so it's important to always use, the, use encryption, yes, not default for this. Make sure you set up your profile to use the encryption, yes, so that you force, you force the encry encryption. Set up the secrets. In this example, there are three secrets I've just set up there. Set up the secrets, and your SSTP server is done. For the purpose of this, mind you, we are not giving out IP via SSTP. We are, we are using static IPs. So on the bridge, the bridge interface that was created for the VOIP internet, for the, for, for the VOIP equipment, that bridge has a static IP address. So the, we are not handing out IP address on the, or via the tunnel. Now let's look at the firewall. Apart from the regular stuff, except the established, except really connected and the stuff like that, there is one area I want to point out. On the DNS. In our DNS server, we have enabled allow remote request. Once you allow remote request, that means the router is ready to serve DNS to whoever asks for, whether on the LAN or on the WAN. It doesn't matter. The router will serve it. So you must put active firewall rule to resist, to drop packets from the one. Otherwise, you become a DNS relay. So here, the regular practice is for us to say for the DNS to drop packet from the one interface. That is not good enough. That is not good enough. The DNS, you tell the DNS to reject the packet. Instead of just dropping, tell the DNS to reject the packet. It has an advantage because it, it says the other end that you don't send that packet to me again. The inbuilt mechanism of TCP IP is being activated by using reject as against using drop. So if you are under, if somebody is giving you D, dynamic, uh, DDoS attack and you are just dropping, your router is sweating, the packets keeps coming and the router is sweating, dropping the packets. But if you reject such packets, a message is sent back to the other end. And if the other end is TCP IP, fully TCP IP compliant, it gets made and stops sending the packets. Even when somebody is hijacking the router, send these packets. But it, it, it knows that the, uh, the host says, this is not, I'm not going to accept this. So please, always do that when you do that. There are other things in this firewall. This firewall is crafted to be very intelligent. It's crafted to be very, very intelligent. It, it leaves the connection open until you start doing what is disallowed. If you t make three consecutive attempts in a minute to connect to Winbox, three consecutive in one minute, the router knows you are guessing. Something is wrong. The, rou the router blacklists your source IP. It will only you will be blacklisted. Other people will be allowed to connect. Blacklist for some time then before it's released. So you can take a look in the firewall. I don't have enough time to explain so much about the firewall. And the quality of service I've explained that earlier. So, so this configuration that was used on the on the headquarters at this SSTP server, the same configuration was used at the client end with the variation that instead of SSTP server at the client end, we have SSTP client at the start. So thank you very much. Question time. You still have to PC. It's not it's just that you have private IP addresses in your network. If you don't have, if you have public IP addresses throughout your network, your, your, your uh, land end is public IP address, then you don't need that. PCQ will still work. You just don't need to configure it, just leave that out of it to work.
Thank you. 